This is Emily from Sex with Emily, and you are watching the Sexy Mr. Media. Enjoy the show. <laughs> Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to performance psychologist Ken Baum. He's got a brand new book out called Mind Over Business, which was written with a guy named, is this right? Bob Andelman. Stick around. This one's bound to be a bestseller, folks. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of professional athletes who always fell one step short of a Gatorade shower until they met Ken Baum in the new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. If Ken Baum ever offers you some ideas on how to improve your game or your business strategy, I suggest you take them to heart immediately. Unlike most guests on this show, who I'm often meeting for the first time, I've worked with Ken Baum, author of Mind Over Business, for much of the past two years as his co-author. So I can tell you firsthand that he has the experience and the savvy to help you, whether in sports, business, or life itself. In this book, the subtitle of which is How to Unleash Your Business and Sales Success by Rewiring the Mind-Body Connection, Ken takes his years of experience working with everyone from Olympic medalists and NCAA champions to Fortune 500 companies and small businesses and gives them an everyman spin. Now, what I liked about working with Ken is that he doesn't overpromise. He lays out a series of steps, tweaks, and adjustments that can make large or small improvements to your career and life. How far you take them is entirely up to you. Now, working with Ken, I got to interview Olympic athletes such as skater Sasha Cohen and bobsled world champion Steve Messler. Hearing their stories firsthand convinced me that Ken has an approach that can work for a lot of people. I also got to see him firsthand in person working with my own soccer girls. Uh, he did some exercises with them, and uh, you know, it was just really interesting to see the kids respond to him in a way that they, well, didn't re ever respond to me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I hope that all of this comes across in the book and that you'll get a taste of what Ken's about in this interview. Now, when he's not on the road giving motivational and performance pr presentations, you can find Ken working with future champions in his Orange County, California gym, Biodynamics Training Center. Ken Baum, my friend, welcome hey, to Mr. Bobby, Media. Hey, Bobby, good to see you, buddy. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, nice to be on this side of the book project, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It was it was a fun project, but I'm glad that we're on the next side of it. Yeah, I'm glad the work part is over. <laughs> now we can just do the fun stuff. Um, so, Ken, I mentioned in the introduction that one of the things that impressed me um, about your approach to, to self-help and motivation is that you're not promising more than you can realistically deliver. You're laying out kind of a smorgasbord in uh, Mind Over Business, and you're saying, here, take what works for you. <clears throat> exactly. You know, what I've learned is that when you're talking about changing behavior, mm -hmm. uh, you need to change the behavior by changing the thought. When you change the thought, you can change the behavior, change the reaction, get a better result. Everybody's different. What works for one person will not necessarily work for another. Uh, there's a lot of um, hype out there. Like there's these secrets that float around. If you grab a hold of one of these secrets, you're going to be the next, you know, uh, Steve Jobs. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, I mean, we, and literally we talked about something called the secret. Um, and you made the point that it's not a secret. It's just a, you know, I, there's a lot of people out there sell, selling a lot of things. Um, and I, I felt like we were pretty careful in here to lay out really concrete action steps as opposed to a lot of malarkey. Exactly. When you consider what I've done for the last almost 30 years, from high school athletes to world-class professionals, to companies like Merrill Lynch and E.F. Hutton, to newspaper companies, to city governments, to, 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 to schooling programs, school systems. Um, what I see consistently happen is that people change because they have the tools. They have to have tools, not catchphrases, to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. Setting goals in a well, way that's compelling, not just writing it down. There's more to it than that. Visualizing in a way that you associate the action that goes with the reward. So in other words, 
we don't just visualize ourselves on the, on, the, on the top of Mount Everest. We must see ourselves take the actions and do the actions. Then the reward comes. If you're not willing to do the actions, the reward will not happen. Think as much positive thinking as you want. If you don't do the task, it's not going to happen. So take us through a couple of the steps here. And, and obviously, it's not my interest to have you give away everything. <laughs> sure. But but take us through a couple of the steps. I guess, uh, do we start with a desire statement? So we do, do we go before that? You know, again, what I found is when people have a reason that's big enough to do something, they'll find a way to get it done. If the reason's not big enough, it's a, if it's a passing fancy or a wish or a dream, it's not going to happen. There must be a reason. So we first start with a desire. What do you really want? Based on that answer, we know how to begin. Now, one thing I tell everybody is this. If there was something you knew that you could do and would be guaranteed to be successful, what would you do? That's a good starting point because if you you know, knew you'd be successful, what would you try? That's probably what's really in your heart. At the same time, if you don't have the resources to do that, it'll never happen. But it starts with, what do I really want? And uh, do people have trouble defining what they want? Or do they know and they're, they're just maybe they're, well, I don't know, they're, they're afraid to say because they, 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 they don't want to fail? You know, Bob, oftentimes you're afraid to say because they don't want to fail. They don't want to sound silly or ridiculous, you know. Uh, it's kind of like this. Can you imagine Oprah Winfrey? when she was back in high school saying, someday I'm going to be a media queen, they would have laughed her out of school. When she got her first job in television that someday she'd own her own network, give me a break. So sometimes what we really want starts with a very simple thing, just getting a break, getting on a, a newscast, you know, and then the rest takes place after that. So you need to know what you want. You need to have the confidence and the conviction to make it happen. Think big, but start small. So you talk about uh, desire statements in the book, and it starts with a, a, a basic desire. Like I, uh, I'm trying to think of a, an example. I I want to be um, uh, I want to earn a hundred thousand dollars this year, and so someone will write that as a desire statement. And then over time, you encourage them to evolve that as they start reaching the goal. It, set a new desire statement, right? And then keep pushing past that. Don't start with, I want to, you know, in Oprah Winfrey's case, don't start with, I want to be the queen of all media because you're not laying out any steps in the in between. You're not laying out a path. You you're, you want them to have a uh, a way to go from A to, a to B to C to D. Is that, am, am I? You're absolutely right, Bob. I, I remember one time I heard a, um, a celebrity interviewed and um, it was Dolph Lundgren uh, who played uh, Rocky's uh, nemesis in one of the Rocky movies. And he said that he was going to be a um, CEO of a oil company and that he had all this talent and all this ability. Well, you can talk all you want, but if you don't start the job and have a base for it, it's not going to happen. Um, I just did my first uh, mental ed session with a baseball player from Florida high school player and he's poised to be in the top 50 uh, draft picks for Major League Baseball. This is a senior year. We're hoping to get him in the top 30 so he can be a guaranteed first rounder. Uh, big money there. His goal, his dream is to be a Hall of Famer. But you first have to make a team, <laughs> right? So, so you may have that as your dream, but his goal is not to be a Hall of Famer. His goal is to be in the top 50 with a little luck, the top 30, and make a roster, see? If that doesn't happen, guess what his, his backup plan is? A full scholarship to the University of Miami. Not a bad way to go, no. see? So that, that's what we are talking about. You, yeah, dream big. You know, go for Mount Everest. But first, you might want to climb Mount Whitney to see if you have the capacity to get there. Right. Plus, that kid who, who wants to be in the, the top 50 draft picks, if he doesn't make that, he goes after the University of Miami scholarship or wherever, that's his second opportunity to to. to to be drafted again and a little more experience, maybe a little more of what the scouts are looking for. Exactly. As opposed to this stuff, you'll hear people say, you know, just think it and you can believe it. You know, believe and achieve. Well, those are nice catchphrases, but there's much more to it. You, you got to have a, a personal action plan, a personal action plan to take into consideration your strengths and your limitations and work on them. So we're talking about um, athletes here and sports. 
how do you make that and I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the athletes you've worked with but how do you connect sports with business because I know you do sales training and you do management training how what does one have to do with the other what what do what do people in business what can they learn from the people in sports interesting question Bob uh, let's go back in time a little bit I was a 23 year old salesperson selling insurance and investments for a living uh, I studied everything I could about selling and communication educating myself about higher end selling how to do estate planning and things like that I was very successful at it became a sales manager became a vice president of a small company company and decided you know what I really want to do I want to be a sports psychologist and so I started in the business world and transferred that knowledge into sports psychology they kind of go hand in hand they really do and what happens is this in the business world so many people lack belief in what they're doing they be, they lack the commitment in what they're doing and they just take a job and say this is what I'm going to do because it was there what I want people to do is do what they want to do with their business life the psychology of achievement is the same setting goals personal action plans working on your strengths taking your your strengths and maximizing them are the same for business people or athletes um, let's talk about uh, some of those athletes now um, I, uh, I mentioned that I got to talk to uh, Sasha Cohen as part of the book uh, that's a great story uh, first of all remind people uh, a little bit about why she stands out in our memory what happened with her and then take us back a little bit to what kind of things you worked on with her Sasha Cohen is a little bitty dynamo incredibly vivacious beautiful girl great skater silver medalist in the Olympics and what was amazing about that was Sasha had the best short program in the history of the Olympic Games nailed it came back for the long program a day after and was nervous as all get out she called me at night I was at the Fox Sports Grill watching NCAA March Madness when she called me and we talked for a half hour I hung up but an hour later she called me again we talked again for a half hour she went out the next morning to do her long program and her eyes were like saucers just big like this and I'm going, oh my goodness I'm worried about Sasha and sure enough she fell on her first jump but as soon as she fell she got up and she did her performance cue that I taught her and she nailed the rest of that program and got a silver medal. Against all odds, a tremendous fall early on, which would have crushed her a year ago, she got up and won the silver medal. And it's that fall that people remember first because it was like, it was like the air was let out of the nation at that point. It was like, oh, this girl, she's so, oh my God, what happened? She fell down. Well, that's the end of her. But no, she got up and she got it back together and she actually looked more composed after the fall it was like the fall took all that all, took all the nerves and the the jitteriness out of her and she got up and she did her thing perfectly that's exactly what happened and and I tell people you know Sasha and I worked together for seven months before the Olympics if I could have had her for nine months I think we would have had the goal <laughs> uh, regardless what I learned about Sasha is she is a tremendous competitor and she knows what she's good at and she knows what she's not good at Therefore, she doesn't spend a lot of time doing what she's not good at. In the business world, I see people constantly working on things they're not good at that don't add to their bottom line. Their priorities are all askew. You must find out what you're good at and find a way to maximize what you're good at and don't spend a lot of time on your weaknesses. Now, if you have a weakness that you must overcome, that's different. Sasha had certain weaknesses she needed to overcome she applied herself to those weaknesses but only because they were necessary so I can see how a sports psychologist would be very helpful to a figure skater because it's such a it's it's a mind game it's a total mind game you know if she believes then she she'll perform if she's nervous she probably won't perform but but how does a guy like you contribute anything to a, a, a bobsled team I mean and I, you know, I'm, I'm obviously I've asked you this before. I, I sort of know the answer here. It's rhetorical, but uh, you know, I think people think, well, it's just four guys. They get on a piece of wood and they fly downhill. But you work with two of the four guys uh, very directly, and uh, and and obviously, I know from talking to Messler, it gives you a lot of credit. You know, when you take a bobsled and you got this little little bitty 
chunk of, it's not even steel, it's like carbon fiber or something. And they're in there, back to belly. They're tight as can be. And you're together all year long this way, traveling and training. You've got things like personalities that you've got to deal with. You've got different work ethics you've got to deal with. You've got leadership issues you've got to deal with. You've got um, uh, delegation issues you've got to deal with. That is a small business right there. Steve Holcomb was the CEO, and Steve Messler was the president. I worked with both of them, and they did an incredible job. Those guys are just such great athletes, it's, it'll blow your mind. When you watch Steve Holcomb, you know, 5'10", 5'11", you know, 245 pounds, cleaning 300 pounds plus, and Messler running the 60 faster than Herschel Walker did, by the way, um, you realize how great an athlete these guys are. But what they were lacking were little things, Bob. Little things about how they thought, about training, about interacting with each other, about how they communicated with each other. And that's where I came in. I don't know anything about bobsled. I mean, I know not, I go down one of the little round discs you hold on at the little snow park. That's what I do. <laughs> but the difference was amazing. The first gold medal in, in the Olympics in 62 years first world championship in over 50. It was a phenomenal result. But they did the little things. They didn't just sweep them under the carpet. They did them. They changed. They changed their behavior by changing their thoughts. So you helped them to interact better with each other, uh, maybe to uh, accept uh, maybe some shortcomings here and there in terms of their personal interactions. Uh, you didn't You didn't tell them how to steer or where to turn. Um, and the other, the other thing I remember is very important is that uh, before they ran their uh, Olympic, uh, their gold medal uh, uh, race down down that, that that hill, there was an accident, right? And it, tell folks uh, about your interaction with them about that accident. Yeah, when that young, uh, uh, I think it was the loser, he 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 died. He crashed, and they started. Everybody's afraid of that that turn, and and the, the, they're saying the the the, uh, the course is too fast. It's too dangerous. They started calling the turn the 50-50 turn. In fact, Steve Holcomb named it the 50-50 turn, and the media picked up on it. As soon as I heard that, I got on the phone to Holcomb and said, hey, buddy, you've got to change that right now. And he did. We changed it to my advantage. Now, think about that. Here they are calling it the 50-50 turn, meaning you get a 50% chance of making it, and you might even die. The Holcomb changing it to this is my advantage. And it was. He destroyed the field. Again, uh, little things. So what mind over business does, Bob, it gives people the ability to control their thought process so they can control their results. The number one fear salespeople have all across the board, no matter what they sell, is call reluctance. They're afraid to contact new customers. They're afraid to cold call. They're afraid to go to businesses. They're afraid to network. This book crushes call reluctance because it teaches you how to think and how to act and actually embrace cold calling and making more money. You have, uh, you have some interesting tips in there uh, for cold calling, um, uh, in, including one in, in person that I, I really liked. I'd never heard this before. I, I don't know if this is original to you, but you tell it well. It's, um, you know, when you go to places that have the sign up that say no soliciting. Well, how do you read? How does Ken Baum read a no soliciting sign? that they're weak and they put that sign up because they're going to buy anything you have to sell. <laughs> now, I did create that. I taught that back, way back in 1985, 86, 87 when I was teaching salespeople. And by the way, I had a public speaking sales training school uh, for years that was very successful. It was a springboard to my public speaking career. So I want to uh, I want to come back though two more two more sports stories and uh, those will be the last sports stories I promise. But you do a lot. You mentioned working with this uh, high school uh, baseball player. You do a lot with baseball players. Uh, two of my favorite stories that I heard from you were Randy Johnson and Carlos Pena. Um, let, let's talk briefly about Carlos and the reason I I was in, intrigued by that of course is I'm in Tampa. Uh, Carlos just returned to us and you you would actually work with him in that off season before he joined the Rays and had his big breakout year. Yeah, Carlos was an interesting guy. Carlos called me up. He read my book, The Mental Edge, and he called me up and said, hey, I need to work with you. I need some help here. I can't hit the ball. He was hitting about 212 or something when I met him. Uh, we met at spring training, and I sat with the, we, we, we did our first session, and it was like midnight, 1230, something like that. And he's almost falling asleep on me, which wasn't a bad thing, because visualizing in a relaxed state is a good thing. Um, we did another session the next day, 
and he's digging it. And he's he's feeling pretty strong. I'm sitting in the stand with with his with his father, and uh, Carlos hits a single, and he feels pretty good about that. And then he hits a home run, and he rounds third. He looks up at the stands at him, me and his father, and he points at me like that. A boy, Ken, thank you. And that was the beginning of great things for Carlos. And and what I what I appreciate about Carlos was he knows he's a gifted athlete. He knows he's the best fielder in baseball at that first base position. He knows he had the potential to hit the ball. He couldn't figure out why he couldn't. I mean, think about it for a moment. You're in Major League Baseball. You've got the best equipment, the best scouts, the best coaches, and he still can't hit the ball. What was he missing? The mental side. What he was saying to himself. His mental preparation was off. We fixed that. I'd like to see you come down and work with him this month, okay, as they're getting ready for spring training. See what you can work out. Yeah, yeah. He's still- <laughs> you get him to that. and that's the other thing about it. Here's the other thing. This happens a lot. You take an athlete like Carlos. They have a great season, and then they forget that they made tweaks to have the great season, mm-hmm. and they stay the same, status quo. And status quo doesn't cut it. Kobe Bryant is Kobe Bryant because he never keeps status quo. Every offseason, what can I do better? What can I do next? Now, I don't know what Carlos did after his great season, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing everything stayed pretty much the same. Because when you get a good result, why change it? Mm. When, the result, when the result doesn't stay consistent, then you've got to look at making adjustments again. Carlos is an interesting athlete. This guy can hit has hit for I think five seasons going now 30 to 40 home runs a year but his he just can't seem to hit for average he can hit for power but he averages you know I mean they, they talked I think two years ago there was a lot of talk about how he he was barely hitting you know above the uh, what do they call it the Mason Dixon line <laughs> yeah, exactly. the, you know that or the no the Mendoza was the Mendoza line I, don't, I can't remember what it's called that he, he was barely staying over 200 but you know you knew 30 40 times a year he's going to come up and put it out of the park so he's worth every penny and there were a lot of hitters through the day that have been that way. Remember Dave Kingman? You oh, know? of course, yeah. Yeah, but he could hit for average. And, and the, Reggie Jackson wasn't a good average hitter. But, you know, if Carlos had that one sterling year. If he did it once, he can do it again. You don't get lucky in Major League Baseball. And hit. I think, what, did he hit 287 that year? Something like that? I don't know what his average was, but I know he, he did hit, I think, was it 50, 51 home runs? 47 home runs, 47. I think. Yeah. yeah. And, Big and so, year. Since then, I mean, still, he's been hitting, you know, 35 to 45 every year, so you know worth it now the other baseball guy in the last sports story i'll ask you about you this was not planned you were not hired to do this you met randy johnson one morning you were both speaking at the same event and uh randy was having a rough time what was going on there randy and i were in, in phoenix doing this mega seminar a mega seminar like fourteen thousand people and uh randy and i met and we're talking and he you know he's saying i'm having a struggle right now and and uh i'm over pitching uh, we're not scoring a lot of runs, and I'm trying too hard. Now, this guy's already a Hall of Famer. Whether he meets me or not, he's going to the Hall of Fame. The difference is he might have went out with a whimper instead of a bang. We did a about a half hour to 45 minute mental edge session, and we worked on what he was thinking and what he was saying to himself. And I changed what he said. I changed what he thought. I told him, "You take my book." You read these chapters. I gave him about three or four chapters to read. To read, He went home, did the exercises, went out that night, Bob, and struck out 20 batters. Tied a major league record. He went on a run of about two and a half years where he was just incredibly tough to beat. He didn't change anything in his pitching. He changed his thought. He changed a little bit of processing in his head. He got a tremendously better result. He seemed he had thought up until that day that he needed to carry his team, that he needed to do this, and I think you helped him to think, you know, you don't need to do that. Here's what you do need to think about, and that was an interesting game too for baseball fans, in that it was it was tied after nine innings. He had gotten his 20 strikeouts. It was tied after nine innings, and then uh, he was with the uh, the Diamondbacks then, I believe. Yeah, Diamondbacks. Right, and then they went uh, they they fell behind in extra innings. He came. He had, he was out of the game, and everyone thought, "Oh my God, what a wasted effort! Twenty strikeouts." And they came back and they won the game. It was incredible. Yep. They won the game, and I'm sitting there thinking, "Don't pull him. We got to get 21. Let's break the record." And then it was just like, you know, are we going to get the win? But what he learned from that is, 
if he focuses on the next pitch, once the ball left his hand, his worries stopped. He never thought again about what was going to happen. And he became a next ball pitcher. So when you're a salesperson, you go out there, you make a sales call. You don't get the close. You don't get the deal. No worries. Next. And you go on to the next one as if you're going to be successful on the next one. And you don't think about the one that you were unsuccessful on. You make a cold call and you get 10 people in a row that reject you. No worry because number 11 is going to be a home run. That's the way Randy began to think, that the next ball is going to be the strike I need. The next ball is going to be the out I need. He never thought about what his team was going to do for him. He thought, what can I do for my team? Now, I'm not going to go into sports so much anymore, but one of the things you talk about in the book is physical cues. Uh, and you, you gave the example of, uh, I want to think, I think you gave the, the example of your own daughter, uh, that you had taught her to use a physical cue. And explain what you would use a physical cue for, and, and not just in, in sports, but in business and anything you would do. What, what is that all about? We've all heard the story of the Pavlovian dog where they would ring the bell and give the dog meat. The, the, the dog would associate the, the meat to the bell and pretty soon they'd take away the meat and just ring the bell and the dog would salivate. Yeah? That's a conditioned response. We can do the same thing with, with, with ourselves in business or sports. When you think of Michael Jordan gliding through the air with his tongue out of his mouth, yeah? mm -hmm. that was a cue that he would use. He did it automatically. He never thought about it. What I teach people to do is install physical cues where they stack successes and it allows you to get back into a success state under pressure. For instance, when I go public speaking, I'll be talking maybe in New York in front of 500 business people or in Phoenix in front of 14,000 people. Well, I don't want to get nervous. I want to be relaxed and calm. So I'll take my wrist and I'll squeeze right across like that and I'll relax myself. Now, this by itself means nothing. What this represents is a reminder that every time I've done this for years, I would put myself in a relaxation state. I would visualize and feel myself someplace where I was at peace. So I go in front of the audience. Nobody knows I'm doing this. I grab that wrist. I exhale, and I'm ready to rock. At the same time, when I want to get fired up and, and aggressive, I put it in my right hand. I take it. I stack all kinds of successes from business and sales and sports and life, and I put it in that fist, and I simply have a word. I say, yes. And when I want to get amped up, I just go, yes. And I'm ready to lift that weight. I'm ready to run that sprint. I'm ready to make that sales call. I'm ready to give that speech. These give experience permanence. The permanence allow you to change your state in an instant when you do these properly. So in Mind Over Business, I give you all the sequence of how to create those performance cues so you can be in the performance zone automatically. Well, Ken, uh, obviously we want people to go out and uh, give Mind Over Business a try. But w I think we also want to mention that it will be available soon uh, on, uh, as an audio book. And uh, you do one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with people. You, you, you come out to their business, obviously for a price. Uh, you, you're available for uh, speaking engagements, all that kind of thing. And, of course, you've got the gym out there in Orange County, Biodynamics. Um, uh, anything else particular that's, uh, that's coming up next for you? I think the one thing I want to make sure people realize is this book changes behavior and changes results. I am so committed and passionate about this book that I'm taking this book to children, uh, 12 and up, that are, that are underprivileged and we're giving free presentations and free book donations because we want to change people's lives. I'm going to go to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in May to help that group of children to, to have hope for their future, but not just hope tangible actions they can take to change their situation. If I can do it, anyone can do it. I came from the disadvantaged background. I came from the school of hard knocks. And I've made it happen to be one of the foremost sports psychologists in the world, one of the top business trainers. Not by luck, because I took stock of where I was at. I looked at my strengths. I looked at my limitations. And I made a conscious effort to change. I educated myself, set a goal, lived it with passion, and good things happen. It can happen for you just like it happened for me. Very good. Well, folks, uh, listen, you can uh, find uh, Mind Over Business by my friend and co-author Ken Baum uh, in great bookstores everywhere as of right now, or you can order it right now at a great price at MrMedia.com via Amazon. 
Uh, Ken, uh, website is uh, mindoverbusiness.com? Yes, sir. That's it. And people can find you on uh, Facebook as well? Uh, Facebook, no, but Ken Baum Mental Edge. Facebook, uh, the, the, the Mind Over Business isn't up yet. Okay. But Ken Baum Mental Edge is up on Facebook. Very good. Uh, Ken, you know, always a pleasure to talk to you and to see you. No, nice, uh, nice job with the shirt and tie. Yeah, you don't get to see me in that very often. Hey, no, by the I... way, Bob, one other thing. If anybody wants to donate a book to the Inner City Cause or the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, you can donate that book in your name. You can buy it through Amazon.com, ship it to us. Have it shipped to us. We'll send it to them in your name. Very good. All right. Well, Ken, good to see you. Continued good luck with the book and everything else. And uh, thanks for joining us on Mr. Media. My pleasure, Bob. Good to see you again. Thanks again for all your effort. Bob's a great writer, by the way, guys. And he's fun to work with. And he introduced me to Chick-fil-A. I love those <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah, Take care, guys. All right. Thanks, Ken. For more original interviews, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. If you've enjoyed today's show, subscribe for free to Mr. Media via email, RSS, or iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Another good idea, download our new free Mr. Media mobile app in the Android market. And you can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many parts of the Internet. Show your support of Mr. Media by supporting our sponsors, including Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. We're also supported by the thepartyauthority.us. Call DJ Ira for all your party entertainment needs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Or visit their website, thepartyauthority.us. If you've got an idea for a guest, a comment on today's show, or would like to advertise on Mr. Media Radio, Email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also call our 24-hour listener line at 1-727-498-4711. Some messages may be used in an upcoming show. And unless you live next door to Mr. Media, there may be a toll charge. You can also follow Mr. Media on Facebook, Twitter, or our new YouTube and Vimeo video channels. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Hey, everybody. This is Bob Andelman from Mr. Media. First of all, I want to thank you for years of support uh, listening to the show. We're starting our sixth year, it's hard to believe, our sixth year uh, as 2012 starts and heading towards our 1,000th online podcast, uh, audio and video. It's uh, pretty amazing, <laughs> frankly. Uh, I remember starting it several years ago thinking, this will never last. And podcasts, that's as stupid a word as blogging. But here we are, <laughs> starting our sixth year and heading up to 1,000 interviews. And I want to thank everybody for uh, listening and supporting the show. I also want to tell you that, uh, you know, one of the things that's been very helpful for this show is Stitcher Radio. Yes, this is sort of a commercial. Now, there are millions of smartphone apps in the world, but I only use one several times a day, Stitcher Radio. I build my own radio station to listen to broadcast and online shows when I want and in the order I want. CNN News Update, Onion Radio News, WTF with Mark Marin, MSNBC's Morning Joe, Studio 60, the TechCrunch headlines, and of course, Mr. Media. It's free. It works on iPhone, Android, BlackBerry, Palm Pre, and much more. And you can get it for free for yourself. Try it out. I guarantee you're going to love it. Stitcher.com slash MR Media. That's Stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. You're going to love it. And thanks again for supporting the show.